later we can just put up. Okay. There will be a glitch coming out of Don't get excited, we still got five minutes. I'll take it out.
call them first. One song, anyway. I'll probably leave That's why I moved down here. You can tell us our mind you're ready to go. That's why I moved down here. <laughs> you guys want to make a little bit of room so Gwen can get through to get to the piano in a couple of minutes? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the San Francisco Lodge of the Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society was organized in New York on November 17, 1875, and has three avowed objects. To form a nucleus of the Universal Brotherhood of Humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. To encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science and to investigate the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. This evening, our speaker is Joe Miller, and the title of his talk is Love. Let's give him a hand. Before we turn Joe loose, I'd like to ask his beautiful wife Gwen to play some meditation music for us. Because to me, the white light is pure love. Pure love. In other words, it's kind of like a Super Bowl of love. <laughs> when your love is a feeling that covers everything, everything you know. This doesn't deny you any human love you may have otherwise, and your responsibility to that human love. But I want to get into it deeper. I want you to understand at least what little I've been able to dig. And the idea is that I don't know it all by a long shot, but I can give you the benefit how I feel about it. 
That's the thing that makes the whole world go round. Call it white life, call it light, call it life, call it beauty. These are all in that one part that's within all of us. I'm glad the bright light is on tonight, although I don't know why I should be in the spotlight. I quit that years ago. Of course, I had never had such a distinguished audience <laughs> listening to me. And that's quite unusual. Because those that I had listening to me were not interested in the particular things you are. Because if you weren't interested in love in its very essence, you wouldn't be here. If you're looking an alibi, alibi, look for an alibi to sneak out of your present responsibility, forget it. I haven't got anything to say to help you to do that. Love is love. Pure love. But pure love, you're not trying to get anything. You're not trying to hold anything exclusive. If the other person loves you and it's going out to you enough and it's going out to her, love is a wonderful thing at the point that everybody meets it, whether to be married or not to be married. That's the question. Most men don't particularly want the responsibility of a family, so they run away from it as a rule, up to a certain point where their foot slips, and then they can't help them. <laughs> now, if your foot hasn't slipped, you've been missing an awful lot. Because you have a chance to play the part of God to those little ones that you bring in, those egos that you bring in. And remember, they're not yours. You don't own them. You just happen to be a good vehicle for them to get here. And don't think that you keep them under your thumb all your life. In the old days, I've met many ladies beyond the middle age spot who said, well, I am devoted to my mother was because her mother kept them under a thumb like that. You've all got your own lives to live. And if it is pure devotion for your mother, that's good. Pure devotion is pure love. Devotion to whoever may be your idea of an anthropomorphic God, a human figure that walked on earth, that represent all of the finest things you could conceive of in your consciousness. If you wish to make that person, that particular avatar, the one that you surrender to, that's wonderful. In theosophy, you can surrender or not surrender. That's up to you. Theosophy shows a way that by getting to your higher mind, by disciplining yourself in your thinking, you can get to the place, and that's called nani. I'm not speaking nani tonight. I'm speaking pure love. And pure love will get you there. Even if it's love for a lesser individual than one of the great ones. Because the very purity of your love will purify your mind as well. Or if you take the mind trip, you've got to work with it gradually and bring it down. Sooner or later you have both the mind and the heart. But the heart is a way that is offered to you by Sufism. Because if you can let your mind drop into your heart to that extent, that you measure everything by the amount of pure love that's coming out of you, then you're following the rule that a gentleman spoke about not too long ago called acceptance of life where you are. Accept what you are and be who you are and what you are. But that complete love for everyone, 
We all say that we're all a part of the one. But how do you know you're part of the one? How do you know it? You want me to give you a few scientific explanations to prove you're part of the one? <laughs> Nobody that I know of that is alive at this level can live without breath. And we don't keep track of the number of breaths we breathe during the night and during the day. We can assume with the breath, and that's one of the places where the word Brahman came from, breath. Without breath, we aren't here. This particular manifestation is eliminated. The breathing in and breathing out. And there's things in the East that teach you that in your breathing in and breathing out that you can put yourself on a discipline so that if every breath you breathe in is on a ha and what you breathe out is a sa, a hamsa. And that's that famous bird that flies. And you should know that your breath influences your thinking. Nobody can stop breathing and still think with any coherence for any great length of time. So when you're angry, you can slow down your breath. And when you slow down your breath to a normal breathing, you're not angry any longer. You say, what did I do that silly thing for? I don't have to be mad. Next time you get real mad, Put your hand on your chest and feel and see how you're breathing. Hyperventilating is what they call it, I believe, in the medical profession, when they're breathing real fast and can't stop from breathing and get more or less hypnotized by it. And then occasionally people throw a fit, an anger fit. After all, in the good book it says, be still and know that I am is God. The I am within you. We are all parts of that one fabulous flame that is the reality. That spiritual flame, sparks in that one flame. There isn't a person here or a person walking the earth that isn't immortal. How are they learning their lessons here? Or how much of the lessons are they learning? And each one of you is a judge for yourself what you wish to change or not change in your living. So you're in the white light tonight, so I'm telling But the Super Bowl of love is to slide into that place where you just love everyone with that great even if they're an enemy of yours. And an attitude that you might have is whoever they are, whatever they're doing, that within them is that same immortal spark that is within you. And the parts you're playing in this lifetime, if you want better parts in a future <laughs> lifetime, what the hell, you better go to work at it, hadn't you? Straighten up and fly right a little bit. You know, as far as boats that go to ships that go to sea, when they get barnacles on the bottom of the vessel, uh, they don't have to scrape them off. All they do is run the vessel into clear, pure water, and the barnacles fall off. So if you can get yourself into the clear light, if you can be still enough, to feel your oneness with that reality that is more than you and yet so intimate to you that you can't live, breathe, or think without it. That pure consciousness within. But that pure consciousness within is located in your heart. That's where the pure part is. And it's watching you. 
and as much as it can get through to you it will you're its special care for the incarnation hoping that you will fall awake a little bit and feel that reality it isn't a matter of thinking it I've known people who have read thousands of books and have no more feeling to it than that hunk of wood right there it's a feeling of love and love is a subtle thing and yet it's the easiest thing in the world when you see a beautiful little child your heart goes right out to them huh but see a bunch of kids that even give you trouble like they do in your classes still there's moments when you find them beautiful isn't there all right find that part of you that recognizes that godliness everywhere which is pure love oh, if you want to make it anthropomorphic it represents some great teacher but you have to do it for you no one else can do it for you. And if you've taken somebody else's word for things and haven't tried it out in your living, that don't count. It's got to be an experience of yourself or you actually feel it. More of our emotions are on the surface of our bodies normally than within until we hit the big one and then we feel it it's just there when you see a situation that's difficult and you're not even involved with it you'll have enough feeling of empathy to send that love towards it so it'll create that harmony and there is harmony in the universe not in our social structure no you get out at night, you look up at the clear blue sky and see all the stars in their orbits continuing those orbits for centuries. There is a law functioning. If you realize that winter, spring, summer, fall comes along very regularly every year. <coughs> There's something of an eternal harmony underneath it all. And all we have to do is tune ourselves into that greater harmony that we've already got a hotline to it within each and every one of us. If we'll just be still and feel it. It's much more pleasant to feel love than it is hate. We can talk of love, we can associate it with just sex. That's still love. Because it's the attraction of one to the other. But when you get to the point where that place in your heart is being attracted to Godhood, then you start feeling a universal part of it. And whoever they are, you try and let them feel your love. Send a feeling of love. And even if you meet some people that you think you're so much smarter that they're practically uh, don't belong to your section, remember, every single one of them has the same thing within it. Even those cows, and I love to eat beef, every one of them has got that same spark that's coming through in its evolution. Except I'm one of the coarser ones. I'm not a vegetarian. I don't think that which you put in your mouth defileth you, but what cometh out. I guess that's pretty clear, isn't it? This isn't something that you have to go and have somebody tell you about, because you've already got it, but you're not using it. You say, oh, well, I'll be too soft if I look at things that way. What are you doing? Remember, there's even policemen, even policemen, one in particular that I know of, that have that feeling of love that comes to them when they're dealing with people, even if they have to shoot them because they're violently fighting against our social culture. They have to keep them in line. But they got a heart. 
a lot of them. They're not just deliberately cruel or putting everybody in one particular class. You always meet someone that causes that flash to come, that flash from inside, a pure feeling of love. And that's the most important thing. Remember of the vehicles that you each have, that if you just looked at your little finger alone and didn't use the rest of the fingers, that's about as much of your bodies as you're using this level. Can you tune into this other part of yourself? This higher consciousness. This love for humanity. And you have to love humanity as a whole because you know there's only one behind it all and I don't think it's a guy with a long white beard. I think it's a force. And I like those movies come out with May the Force Be With You. And I hope the same thing, May the Force Be With All of You. And every time I say Yafata, I'm thinking and feeling that. Because I'm kind of fumbly-bumbly yet, and if I can't feel it just by itself, I know that if I say the words and put my mind on the trip, that it will surrender to the higher part within me and give out love. Live love. And after all, I'm a pretty good recommendation even for the limited aspect that I represent. I'm 84 years old, and I haven't got any lumbago or rheumatism or anything like that. Huh? I must be doing something right. Can't be all wrong. It's working for me to that extent. And I think for as little as I understand it, that that's a very broad extent. I don't know whether any of you sitting in here will pay any attention to anything I have to say. And that don't make any difference because the seeds are being planted within you, a stimulation to that part of you. At least you met one old fogey once who told you what it was all about. Sure, we get back to this level of down here on earth and in these bodies. Huh? Just an attraction of another person is what makes all our advertisement go. We never see any ugly women advertising anything. And we never see any puny men like me on TV advertising anything. It's only the heroic figures that can cause, you know, a little irritation of that part of our anatomy that is always pulling towards the opposite sex. But if you're going to have love, make it big. If you're going to have physical love, make it so that you have a higher aspiration, that you want to fall awake. And if both of you have got that feeling, the interest will be just as vital, male and female, huh? Come on, you got a chance. The idea of you coming here and listening to this old fossil who, who don't know a heck of a lot, but nevertheless I'm trying to share with you what I've dug out of it. I want you to get the feel of it. Sure, I put out a lot of words, and in one case I put out words for about three years. And then one of the customers that I had that was coming to the meetings, he called me up on the phone, and he said, well, this and this and this and this. I said, listen, what do you think I've been talking about for the last five years? <laughs> he said, I know, but I didn't hear you. And that's the way it is mostly. We don't hear it. Or well, we're quiet. Maybe just before we go to sleep. Or just after we wake up. And feel the glory that we are in ourselves and what we can open up to. What a wonderful thing. Sufis, when they first came to this country, had to have a separation of the various groups. This group, that group, the other group, and so forth. 
and they've now come to the conclusion that a Sufi is a Sufi, regardless of which group he belongs to. And that's factual. And theosophy? Some of the best theosophists in the world don't even know that the Theosophical Society exists. But they're living a life that is exemplifying those wonderful things that can be had. And all the Sufis and the Theosophical deep. And we've got Theosophical societies that they're strictly square. They're helping those who are fanatics in their particular line. But we got others maybe are open too much like we are. We're just wide open. But nevertheless, the founder of the Theosophical Society, HPB, said for you to realize, like the same thing that happens to you when you wake up in the morning and you say, I am. You know you are, because you're awake. Huh? And that's all you can say, I am. Huh? Because other than that, what you're wearing here are very limited tools of what you have within you that you could use. And you find them each in your own way. Some little event will occur to you. Or you'll see something. Grab it. If it's there for a second, then you feel that complete love flowing out. Keep it alive. Very alive. Sure, disciplines for that too are practices. And some of the practices are very fine. If they weren't fine for the people at the level they are, they wouldn't be doing them. But you, each one of you are individuals at this level. So each one of you has to find the particular thing that will bring to you a broader concept of what it's all about. And it can't be much broader than it's all a oneness. So we're trying. So the, I don't know how many thousand people live in this town. <laughs> This is just a mere handful, but it's a heck of a lot of people to pack into this room. But I'm trying to share with you, you know? I'm hooking you. I'm getting you karmically indebted. Then some other life when you come in and I'm down in the slums, it's your job to pull me out, see? Get the idea? You say, I don't know what there is about that guy, but what the hell, we better do something for him anyway. <laughs> And this particular life is very important because you have to meet life day by day. And there's no particular pattern that can be given to you that will explain each crisis you will meet as you go along. <coughs> what would be better than the internal harmony of the oneness of God and the feeling of that love falling out? See, if you live a certain way, you think, well, at the end of this, it's just going to all be over. And, and there's nothing else. It's just a blank. I'm done. That's not true. When a person slips out of this body, because the only thing that dies is the thing that you're wearing, the reality of you and your consciousness does not die. Find yourself on the astral plane with your same feelings that you had here. Just because you die don't give you the rights to a pair of wings or ride the lightning or whatever it is or shoot the sun. Huh? Come on. you got to fall awake here. That's part of the deal. The only way we can escape the wheel of samsara is to realize the realities and the potential of the whole pattern of humanity. We've got a couple of rooms full of books, and we've got ten bookcases full of books in the basement. And I don't think in any year's time at the present deal 
that more than 15 or 20 books are taken out. But in days gone by, it was different. But now we're in a different age. If you want to read a book on theosophy, go back and look at them. When you find one you feel empathy for, borrow it. Take it home. Live with it for a couple of weeks. See what you get. But you see, you've got to find somebody that is written in such a way that it clicks with you. Then you get something out of it. Otherwise, you don't. But it was wonderful for you to come down here on the Sunday night and uh, be here in all this bright light and not suffer for it. So you don't realize that you're all on. See? You're all doing it. <laughs> you're all hooked with the same thing I am, whether you know it or not. And how you react to it or take some of it away, it's entirely up to you. You can walk out of here and say, that guy Miller is as nuts as he can be. That's all right. I don't mind. You can't insult me. I'm too damn ignorant. Go ahead. That's okay with me. But what I have learned and I'm trying to use, I want to pass that on. Just as one person to another. I don't see any clairvoyant visions. I don't have some spirits come and visit me. I don't have somebody play a special kind of a music so I can go into a trance. Nothing like that. I'm just taking it from here. And my own deep thinking and my own deep feeling. And I've found out that love works out best. And there isn't anybody that's nearly as low as you might consider them to be. You go down the other side of Market Street and look at some of those people or some of those guys that are hooked on a wine bottle and say, oh, too bad, he's got a fixation. We never stop to think of whatever fixation we've got that's holding us in the particular position we're in and keeping us from getting somewhere. Huh? Think it over. But you see, where I want to get is not somewhere. I want to get nowhere. I want to get to the reality itself, where it all comes from. And I find one way of going with love that you always have that effervescence and you always have that feeling that the great masters that came and understood that could feel that way towards other people and would all help us to grow. Love is the most wonderful thing. If we didn't have love, somebody would invent it. <laughs> but you know, it doesn't have to be invented. It just comes out naturally. You want to ask some questions on love? Go ahead and I will stagger through it. Who wants to ask me some question here? Put me on the spot. Be my guest. Okay, Bob. So, you know, if you feel like, I feel like, oh, I really love someone. And it's really feels so real, you know. And then times pass, things change, you know. Something happens, I don't feel that anymore. Mm -hmm. So what? What? You want to know about that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You were in love with an ideal. You were in love with what you thought was there, but you hadn't examined the other person or hadn't let the other person come out enough to you. So you knew the kind of thoughts and feelings that they had, so that a harmonious union could continue. So therefore, that part of you just shut off, cold. Get better acquainted first. Be friends, good friends, deep friends. Find out where they want to go in life. See if their higher views and their higher ambitions are the same as yours. Then maybe you can get together in a oneness. Truly a oneness. Because it will be like one spiritual being then moving on through this level. And what a wonderful thing it is. I think I'm lucky that way. Because my wife is just as crazy as me. 
See, we didn't particularly get married for sex, although I'm not opposed to it, you know. <laughs> although there may be frost on the roof, there's still fire in the basement, you know. But whatever we go up against, we can hang it up and look at it. And we both are working for the same thing. We both want to fall awake in this lifetime to become aware enough of the other so that we can be of more service to people, help them. So this is what we're going through. I don't know whether we're going to make it this time or a half a dozen lifetimes or not from now, but it don't make any difference. I'm not going to stop. Just because I get shuffled out of a body isn't going to change my view of being a bodhisattva someday, helping everybody. But I'm very glad that the peer made me a madzu, because I am a madzu. The Palace of Fine Arts, and he'd come in, and I said, Hello? He said, hello, Joe. I said, look, can the Chisti order use another manzo? He said, yes. <laughs> well, I said, I'd like to have you make me a manzo. He said, make you a manzo, you're one now. He said, sure. he said, sure, I'll accept you, but unofficially. <laughs> So he did. Then, Moynadine, his group. I went to the meetings, Jamiats, and nobody's supposed to go to Jamiats except those that are hold a position and rank in the group. And so I said, I, I, they asked me a question. I said, well, I'm here, but I don't have any right to answer it. I haven't gone through these various steps. And so the secretary spoke up and says, you've gone through the 11th degree. You're, a, you're one of those people that teaches other people. God bless. So it was a funny thing because neither to the peer nor to the sirs did I ever join them. But I was one. That's all. I am one, and it takes one to know one, so I guess Moina Dean and the pair both figured I was one, so I am one. Fair enough? That's one, one way to do it. And I, I had a guy that he said, uh, he came to one of my talks, and he said, uh, Well, Swami Joe, Chittanandaji. I said, What do you mean, Swami Joe? Oh, he said, you've been a Swami for you. I said, thank you very much. So I became a Swami. <laughs> then there was a lady that had a little Christian order. And she said to me, you're really a minister. <laughs> so she says, I'm making you a minister in my particular religious order. And she did. So must have been something going at some of the time that pushed me in this direction, and I love it. But I never claimed to be a, a reverend so-and-so or a swami so-and-so. But I, I am very proud of my uh, title as a uh, the one that Pierre gave me, Madzu. <laughs> I think I fit that. A man zoop is a guy that's drunk on love. I'm drunk on love of people and you don't know what to expect from them or when to expect it. And that's been my life. And I loved it very much. Any more questions on love? Who wants to give one? Where are you? <laughs> my God, you're on another world. Come around the corner. <laughs> let me see your face. me. <laughs> oh, now you can go back in the other room if you want, but ask me the question. Ask me. Catholic, it's too much like the confessional talking to I see, I see. Well, give me a nasty question now. Don't I never? Okay, um, I'm a 
Um, it's easy to listen to you, and it's easy to get the feeling for what you're saying and <laughs> expressing. And um, and so what I was realizing when I was sitting in there is that that sometimes it's hard. It's not easy like it feels like it is when it's here and when you're talking to us. We don't have to do anything except listen. But you do have times when you have that feeling, don't you? Right. But what's the story on when it's difficult or when you feel like you should be, you know, you know that if you could feel that love or relax or something that it would really be a lot better for everyone involved and it, but you would certainly enjoy it more. What's the story on when it gets hard? Well, I think... Geez, I could say something about that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, I think it's a bit of a bit of research into your consciousness of why you can't get into that state, commonly called in psychology retrospection, would show you why you were in that state. And that if you wish to, you could drop it or nullify it so you could be in that state. So you don't have to think about it then, but, but think about it after? That's what you're saying? Well, if you could think about it then, it makes it a lot quicker. Well, I don't like to think about it. I know. You get PO'd at something and you don't want to shift gears, huh? No, but I, I, my, my mind and, and, and um, I don't know, I can't figure out that state really with my mind. What, I know when it's, when, it's, when it's on, when it's happening. Well, I, I'll tell you... Know, my mind has been useless as far as... Trying, you know, I'll tell you one really. way that would help you. If you would just, if you could, meditate. And by meditating, I don't mean following any particular formula, but just be still. Completely <clears throat> still as far as your lower mind is concerned. And the higher mind will give you the answer in a feeling, nine times out of ten, rather than words. But just think of what happened that made it that way, and then just drop it. Try to drop it if you can. Just be still. Be lazy. Be halfway asleep, but don't go to sleep. And then probably it'll come. Okay? Thank you. But that other part, you left me an awful opportunity, but I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? One more. Yes, sir. What is love in the spiritual sense? I'm just interested. Love in the spiritual sense is the same as love in the physical sense, except it goes up grade after grade, and you've yes. still got it all. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of interested. But it isn't. Love isn't something I know that you impose on anyone. It has to be a meeting between the souls of the people which they work out at least on a lower level through their feelings and thoughts about what they want to be, whether they want to go on with this or not. But as far as your feeling of love to someone other than that, but if it is for a formal association of one physical person with another, uh, you can have that and you're just as good as any animal that ever walked. Or you can have that and be a god. Depending on where you live. More question? Yes? Uh, <laughs> this will be tricky, I know. She's a damn smart. <laughs> okay. I'm not anyone smart about love than anybody else's. <laughs> it's not an area that, as Lois was saying, it's not an area that's really open to smartness. But what my question is has to do with is, I understand the feeling of essential love when you respect the other person's essential yeah. being and you see that's the same as your essential being. And that love, really, you can have that love for anybody. You can have that love for E and me. You can have that love for Hitler because you're seen as a human being and that's their essential spark. You're looking at that essential that's spark. But then right. you can have love. That's right. right. But on the relative level, we're inhabiting a world with people with a lot of different personalities. People have a lot of different programs in life about what they want to do or what they think they don't want to do and this whole, all these trips mm -hmm. of personal interaction. So I'm just trying, how do you, how do you bring those two things? It's like you could have that quality of essential love for somebody and yet you still, because you have personality differences or maybe it's like you have that essential love for someone and there's no physical attraction, there's no chemistry or the other way around. 
There is chemistry, physical attraction, personality compatibility, but it's hard to feel that essential spark. <laughs> I don't understand how to. I think if, if two people wanted to get along for any length of time, they'd have to do a lot of searching in each other. Get it all out worked out. Get it worked out before they have a marriage and there wouldn't be as many divorces as there are. So if you find someone that's got everything that's going for you, if necessary, get them down and beat them until they tell you where the hell they want to go. And if you don't think that's the right way, try to straighten them out. That's what I would do. If I were him. I don't know how he'd like it. <laughs> A lot of people have tried it and failed. Because he had the smooth tongue and a wonderful personality. And in normal cases of his attraction to another feminine individual, he twists them around his finger and then tosses them in the bed. <laughs> okay? Why did you say, it? you said something at the beginning of what you said there was true. It's easy enough to love even a Hitler if you think of that immortal spark. Yeah, but she still wouldn't want to live with him. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> I'm not Hitler. suggesting that you try to Hitler. find a Hitler for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah. you gotta, you got to work the things out, and if they don't work out in depth, well, then I guess you'd have to keep on uh, going along in life and uh, auditioning people until you found one that was right. Do you think that's, is that really what happens? I mean, do people really, you really audition people? No, I'll deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> they fall in love with somebody, and maybe they get a little, and then somebody disappears because they don't want the responsibility of raising a family. And then sometimes they spend the rest of their life longing for that one that left. And if they do so, they're cheating themselves. They should turn it off and see when the next one comes along that causes that. Huh? Then. I mean, if you just stay open and concentrate on the loving part, that's really the essential loving part. I mean, if that's how you live your life, that you really concentrate on that. Then the other things, the thing on the personal level, won't just work themselves out like everything else. Is that that's, really right. Okay. that's right. But I wouldn't sign any contract until the things were worked out because uh, uh, the contract won't hold for very long. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have as many single parents as we have in the world today, which is now, I understand, has got to a place where it's about 40% of our population and need not be that way. Because all of the glorious things that a person could experience go through and lift themselves to a higher plane, they can get right there. Because you see, if you took a half a dozen men and a half a dozen women and you turned them all upside down, hey, there isn't a hell of a lot of difference. <laughs> Upside down? Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention, maybe I'm getting a little too clear on this. <laughs> What's the next question? Joe, I just wanted to add one thing. I believe that if we take time to bring ourselves to help and recognize ourselves as divine, That's true, but then again, you might pull yourself back in making yourselves feeling that you're divine, your own particular fixation, whether you are or not. And therefore, you might refuse many people that you see, and one of them the least likely 
If you talk to them, you might find that they were heading in the same direction. But feel that divineness, but don't let it show as pride. Keep the common touch. Because remember, you're related to everybody, and everybody is related to you. Okay? So we have our social norms that we have to stay with, yes. But you can use the rare thing called discrimination <coughs> in picking the one you wish. Okay? Yes? Well, if the longing isn't reciprocated and it goes on long enough, it'll turn itself off. <laughs> Is that clear? In other words, so what? That guy's dead, as far as I'm concerned. That's the way to do it. But as long as you still want to fight him, fighting somebody, you're just as much attached to him if you were, if you didn't have anything to do with them, more so. Because that fighting thing is sometimes considered a part of connubial happiness <laughs> in some minds. In fact, I'll tell you a story about that. I had one wife. I had two children by her. I come home late one evening, and she jumped on my back, scratched the hell out of me. And I come home with men, and I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't lean that way. And I reached back with my hand and grabbed her neck and threw her over on the floor. <laughs> and she said, oh, you do love me. <laughs> now, there was somebody inviting me to beat her for the rest of her life. But I quietly and sedately Move myself out of that association. <laughs> I didn't want somebody that I had to beat for him to feel that I was in love with him. And if you want somebody to beat you, there's just certain neighborhoods you can go into and they'll beat the <laughs> hell out of you. So you get a cross-section of kind of the wild ideas that this Miller has. Remember, they're my own opinions, so you don't have to use them for your own. Of course not. I don't put myself up as any someone to follow or as a teacher. I'm just a friend, and all I can do is give you the common sense that I've accumulated for myself over this period of time, whether it is common sense or just a mad zoo running wild, I'm not sure. But I enjoy it. And that's the wonderful part. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Life's something to be enjoyed. My wife, I can't do it, but when she gets up in the morning and she gets in the shower, she starts singing right away, even when she's hitting herself with cold water. What are you going to do with somebody like that? You can't keep them down. They got you. That's all. I can't do it. When I first get up, I want that three cups of coffee first. And of course, I know it's not decaffeinated either. I want to know it's coffee, see? And then by then, I'm waking up a little. <laughs> the world's a pretty wonderful place. Huh? So I'm just trying to pass along a few things that I've dug for myself. Don't blame the Theosophical Society. <laughs> <laughs> They're a very erudite group, and all the goodness that I've got out of life happened by my inspiration that I received through the Theosophical Society. Do you know a figure like this? I talked to you. I've let you have it. I've let you have a little laughter. I've let you add a little seriousness. But more than that, you've done a little thinking. Now what I've said 
is somewhere encapsulated within your consciousness, whether it's in the subconscious mind or not. And someday as you go through life, you'll find maybe there's something there you can use. And if you can use it, God bless you for using it, and I hope you can. And if you can't, you can say, well, he was fairly entertaining old fossil anyway. <laughs> huh? That's one way to look at it. Now I want you to sing a little song with me. Breathing in and breathing out, that's what life is all about. You have lots of time to spend, breathing out and breathing in. That particular verse, is in one of the Upanishads. And we had a young man come here who knew nothing about the Upanishads. And yet he wrote that as a song. He isn't around anymore. It was very beautiful. And if just that one thing he brought through, and the hundreds of people since that time have had him sing it, it's to his credit. He's gone. You know, you've heard about these records that we used to see in one minute of the future and so on. Well, he self-destructed himself. But that song will live on. And I know it will give him karmic credit for the levels he's gone to. So here and there people drop something on my back or in my pocket for me to use. Maybe it's the very best that they have. I go ahead. I want to stimulate that same kind of love in all of you. And someday you'll do it. You'll say, well, so what? It didn't turn out the way I wanted to. But love in me can never stop coming out if I just leave the door of my heart open. And that, I think, is a good way to go. And after I've been going that way for this many years, I'm not going to change it. To hell with it. I'm going to go on the same way. Huh? I love you all. And I can feel that universal love. For thou art everywhere. It is enough to know to be that reality and live it. And no scientist can give you a very good explanation of love. They'll end up with sex. <laughs> and it's more than that. Because you can touch the glory, a higher glory, by just trying to. He had a birthday last Wednesday. Let's sing him a, ha a belated happy birthday. He's 84. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joe. Happy birthday to you. Now let's give him three alpha tops. love from our heart to yours. <laughs> I picked up something over the last year. Our speaker next Sunday is Lila Skelly. Where is she? Tooth Fairy, where the hell are you? <laughs> Stick your head out here so I can see you. This is a lady and all the time I've known her over 20 years. I've never seen her have a sad puss. <laughs> She's always been happy. Her title is All Well That Love Well. 
<laughs> Don't forget our basket at the head of the stairs that uh, helps us to pay our bills and our rent so we can keep this place going. Thank you all very much for coming. Let's join hands. Just a minute, I'd closing. like to tell a little story for you. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, we went out to see a lady that passed her 100th birthday. And today, I went to see a little guy that had a birthday on the same day as mine, was just one year old. And you know, that little, lay, that little lady lying in a hospital bed looked like a little doll. And what we're going to sing now, we sang to her. And when we got through singing it, she went like this. And some of those gray cells have already been shut off in her case. But that feeling, she got it. So let's hold it. May the blessings of God rest upon you. May those peace abide with you. May His presence illuminate Turn it off? Yeah. Where? Uh, I saw the light. You gonna leave a copy of that in the lodge?